momento me congratulo en presentar a la doctora y amiga Sara Chan, directora del Instituto para la Ciencia, Ética e Innovación de la Universidad de Manchester. Sara Chan es, aparte de ser profesora e investigadora a tiempo completo en bioética y derecho. Ella, eh, su educación de licenciatura la obtuvo de la Universidad de Melbourne, en Australia, donde recibió precisamente el título de Derecho y Ciencias Biológicas. Y pasó un número de años como investigadora en un laboratorio de biología molecular antes de que se cambiara o fijara su interés en el área de las ciencias políticas y la ética de las ciencias troncales o estaminales. En 2005, Sara inició en el Centro para las Políticas y Éticas Públicas de la Universidad de Manchester, donde terminó su doctorado, su doctorado y maestría en Derecho Médico y Bioética. Desde entonces es investigadora del Instituto de Ciencia, Ética e Innovación que ahora dirige. Bienvenida, Sara. Gracias. Uh, voy a hacer mi presentación en inglés, es más fácil para mí. So, my topic for the presentation is uh, something, a slightly different direction. I'm going to talk about the development of stem cell therapies and some of the issues that we're going to face along the way towards development of these new therapies. As we said in the introductions, stem cell research has been driven largely by our hope uh, for its potential for regenerative medicine and for therapeutic applications. So we have on the one hand the hope of new treatments, for example, as Ricardo said, for neurological disease and injury, for chronic diseases such as diabetes, for organ repair, for cardiovascular disease, for regenerative medicine, and so forth. Sometimes stem cells are talked about in terms of hope versus hype because, of course, all of the excitement, all of the claims that we might make about possible future treatments and all of the hope that has been generated might be overstated sometimes by the media. This has led to a situation where critics of stem cell research and those who may be opposed to stem cell research, perhaps, let's say, for, for ethical reasons, ask why these therapies are taking so long. Why is it taking so long for stem cell therapies to produce results? In the last few years, in fact, we have started to see more and more stem cell-based therapies start to come online. They are starting to move now to the application phase. We mustn't forget, of course, that some forms of stem cell therapy have been in widespread clinical use for many years. So, of course, bone marrow transplants um, and hematopoietic stem cell transplants are very well established as a treatment. But clinical trials involving stem cell therapies the experimental use of stem cells and treatments in medical practice are on the increase. And we have also seen in recent years a rise in the number of companies and clinics that are providing or claiming to provide stem cell based treatments. And again, as Ricardo said, the effectiveness of this may not always necessarily be proven. The conditions under which these treatments are being provided may not be standardised and this can create some problems. But just to give some examples of the sorts of target conditions, the sorts of diseases for which stem cell treatments are being, being offered and being trialled at the moment. Uh, injuries requiring tissue repair, neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's, such as Alzheimer's are common targets. Uh, spinal cord injury is another very common um, intended target for stem cell therapies. And particularly, I think, in reference to the third point to companies providing stem cell treatments, um, perhaps not necessarily with uh, full scientific proof, increasingly we're starting to see cosmetic applications of stem cells. So a lot of clinics in Asia, for example, are offering stem cell treatments to improve cosmetic appearance for skin and so forth. So these are the kinds of conditions for which we are thinking about stem cell therapy. Just to give you another couple of specific examples, so these are all from the last two years. Uh, in 2011, so sorry, now three years, uh, scientists reported that they had successfully tissue engineered a synthetic windpipe, uh, the trachea, from, from stem cells. 
So they actually used for this um, an artificial, a synthetic uh, scaffold and populated this with stem cells that, were, that then formed a windpipe that was transplanted successfully into the patient. So that's an example of tissue engineering. And another example, and this is actually one of the types of conditions for which quite a number of trials are taking place, is treatment for diseases of the eye that cause blindness. So for example, macular degeneration. This is a report, um, on the left you have the report from The Lancet in 2012 about the use, in this case, actually of embryonic stem cells or cells derived from embryonic stem cells in a trial for the treatment of macular degeneration. Uh, and on the right you have the, the claim of the telegraph that it has worked in blind patients for, for the first trial. So these patients didn't magically regain perfect vision but they showed some improvement, and more importantly, the, the trial was to show preliminary safety data for, for the treatment. But in fact, um, experiments like this for various forms of eye disease um, are, are increasing, and they are showing considerable success in the preliminary stages. So finally, I think we are in a position where the potential is starting to be fulfilled, so the hope is starting to become a reality. But with these new these new stem cell therapies, a number of questions and concerns begin to arise. So of course there are ethical issues with the process of clinical research itself. So there are issues raised by research involving human beings, there are issues raised by research and therapeutic procedures that involve the use of human tissue. So if, for example, a cell line from a patient is going to be used to make medicinal products that will be distributed to other patients, that also has ethical implications. But what I want to talk about today is the various possible pathways that we have to development and provision of stem cell therapies, and the implications of these different pathways to development for how and whether stem cell therapies actually live up to their promised potential. So the kinds of questions that we're going to have the kinds of questions that scientists, healthcare providers, patients, policy makers will have. Will these treatments work? Are they safe? How are we going to know whether they work and they're safe? When will they become available? Where? In which countries will they be available? Who's going to be providing them? Will it be through the hospitals and the clinics? Will it be um, through a company? How will we get access to them? Who's going to be able to access them? So, for example, if they're available in one country and not another, that will have implications for who can have the treatment. How much are they going to cost? That's another factor in who's going to be able to access new treatments. So, with all of these questions, we need to think about how we're going to address these issues in the process of development of new therapies. So, we can think about the process of developing therapies as something that starts with our, our drivers, our reasons for wanting to conduct this research. Then we have the process by which um, an idea, a scientific suggestion uh, becomes tested and eventually results in our end goal, which may be a treatment. So let's think about what, what is it that drives the process of development? What are we putting in to push through? And what is the end goal? What, what do we get out at the other end? because both the goals and the, dri the drivers for developing new therapies have implications for what happens in the middle. So what our reasons are for doing it and what we want to get out at the end is going to affect what happens in between. And conversely, of course, how we do the process, what happens in between, is going to affect what we get out at the end. So, for example, if the driver for wanting to do research into stem cell therapies is general humanitarian need to alleviate the burden of disease and to increase the welfare of persons, then our goal to, to meet that need is going to be the provision of safe, effective stem cell treatments readily available to the population of concern. Now, I haven't defined who the population of concern is. Uh, you might think, well, we're concerned perhaps with people who are in a given disease group, um, maybe people a given country, but we might also think actually our goal should be to improve human welfare globally. This may necessitate some conditions, of course, with respect to the cost of new treatments and access in terms of availability if we're going to meet that goal. Then we might look at the one, another driver being an individual patient's need for treatment. 
So if you look um, for how stem cell therapies are being discussed, a lot of the interest comes from patients and patient groups who are desperate to find some sort of cure for their disease. From the point of view of an individual patient and the doctor treating that patient, the first goal is actually, I want to get better. I want an improvement to, to my condition. So in this sense, what, what they want is something that's safe enough, given the other options available to them. There may not be any other treatments. Um, they may face uh, a long and drawn out period of suffering and degeneration if they don't try this treatment. So what something that for them is safe enough and they want it to work, obviously. Now, this, these drivers and these goals are not incompatible with the first goal of developing proven treatments for others, but the priorities are different, I think, in each case. If you're the patient, you want your treatment, you want it to work, that's your most important goal. If you're a policymaker who has public health objectives in mind, what you probably want to get out, the, the goal for you is that across all possible interventions, not just stem cell therapies, but all possible courses of action that you can take, Given the resource limitations, what you want to do is increase population health. So increasing um, healthy life years is important, but there are also other considerations, including what are the other possibilities and how much is it going to cost. And finally, we talk sometimes about uh, push-pull models of innovation. So this, um, this diagram that I talked about, you can sort of push things in at one end, but you also can have reasons to get things out at, at the other. One of, if what we want to get out at the other end, if one of the pools that's driving research is the possibility that um, new treatments may have commercial potential, the fact that we may be able to make money out of selling stem cell treatments. So we know there is a demand, we know there are patients out there who want these, there's going to be a market. If that is what your, if that is what your driver is, then it might be the case that marketability it may be a more important factor than proof, safety, efficacy, or availability. Now, obviously, if you start selling treatments that don't work and are very dangerous, that's going to have consequences further down the line. But if what you're thinking about is, can I sell this? That maybe that's the first thing you're thinking about. Can I sell it and how can I sell it? Okay, so we see these different drivers and end goals at work in the various pathways to provision of treatment and for the development of new therapies to the stage of widespread clinical application availability and I do want to stress that clinical application and consumer availability are not necessarily the same thing. But I think we need to ask what ought to be the end goal with respect to novel stem cell therapies? What is it that we want to get out? What's the ideal goal? What do we want to get out of the development process? And I think from a moral point of view one of the most important goals has to be to reduce suffering, to increase welfare. In other words, our goal, our moral goal for stem cell therapies should be to produce treatments that are safe, effective and available to all on a fair basis. So in order to achieve that goal, there are a number of different factors that we need to balance. Just to give you some examples, we'll need to balance the individual demand for treatment, the patient's desire to have a treatment that works and to try different things in the hope that they will find something that works, with the risk that might pose to individual patients. So patients may want to try a treatment, but how much risk do we let them undertake in order to, to let them try it? We need to balance the need for rapid availability, because remember, every month longer, every year longer that it takes for therapies to come online, patients will suffer and patients may die from lack of therapies. <coughs> so we want these treatments to become available as quickly as possible. But on the other hand, we also want there to be proof of safety and efficacy, and that takes time. And then we have to balance the desire to go down the easiest and fastest development route with the demands of global and social justice. So, for example, we might need to think about where, how, and on whom the research is carried out versus who's going to benefit from it. It may be cheaper and easier to do our research in one place, but if the population who's most in another country, is that fair? Is that with the demands of global justice, and I would say perhaps not. We also need to think about how the research is funded. To recruit um, privately funded support for stem cell research, um, but that may have implications for access down the line if treatments are only going to be made available on a commercial basis. So we might get to the treatment fast, 
not everyone might be able to access it, and that could be a problem. Sex with all of these factors by making rules about medical treatment and research can be carried out, by setting rules and standards for the provision of healthcare products, and also for setting consumer standards in terms of general safety. The regulatory environment can also have indirect effects on the direction of research into new treatments. So, for example, the approach to medical and consumer liability that is present within the, the jurisdiction in general may influence what doctors do, what companies do, how products are provided. And the regulation of associated areas of basic research can also influence how the field develops. This is particularly the case for stem cells, which are much more tightly regulated in some jurisdictions than others. So if you can't do the basic research, how are you ever going to get to the, to the therapies? Beyond that, there are also wider policy influences on the development of therapies. So for example, the healthcare and research priorities of, of national policy makers will influence which routes are chosen, which areas are prioritized for more research. And of course, there may be other national priorities that affect the direction of research. So for example, some countries may decide that investment in biotechnology is a good strategy for economic development. So their motive may be partly we want to produce research and therapy, but they may also have broader development goals in mind. So uh, for example, Singapore recently has put a lot of effort into developing their biotechnology and stem cell research sector as part of a national strategy, not only within the idea of um, the healthcare the healthcare benefits that we produce. So in choosing which process we take, in choosing which pathway to, we want to take in order to get a possible new treatment through that development pipeline, we need to have regard to how all of those factors are balanced, what's the optimum combination of those factors to reach our goal, and how are we going to make policy and regulation in order to direct research down that path. The different processes for developing stem cell treatments have different effects with respect to the factors that we've discussed. And what I want to do in the next part of my talk is to go through some of these differences and the, their implications for the development of new stem cell therapies. So what are the differences between the various ways that we can go about bringing a therapy to the clinic? I'm going to talk about three main models, and this is a little bit simplified, of course, but I think the differences are salient between these three pathways under which we could provide therapies. So when we think about medical research into new therapies, probably the first thing that springs to our minds is the clinical trial. So formal clinical trials have a recognised research process. They usually have defined ethical requirements. Uh, they are governed by policy and guidelines, both international and international, and they may also be governed by, uh, by national level regulation. But there are also ways of providing experimental treatment outside the context of a clinical trial. So for example, within the healthcare context, doctors may be permitted to administer unproven treatments to their patients if they think there's going to be some medical benefit. So this is not a, oh, <laughs> this is not a clinical trial. Uh, it is classed as medical treatment. It takes place within the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, it is still the administration of a treatment that is, let's say, at the experimental stage in that we don't know for sure that it works yet. But that's going to be governed by slightly different rules. And finally, and I've, I have struggled a little bit with how to describe this, but finally we have the case of general provision on a consumer basis of... Um, general provision on a consumer basis of... We might call them treatments, uh, but perhaps they are not proven in the absence of a clinical trial or any other evidence regarding effects and safety. And usually, of course, this is on a commercial basis. So a number of the companies that, um, that have started up claiming to provide stem cell treatments are more or less doing this. They're offering treatments, but there may not be adequate proof of efficacy, and it's a who comes and wants the treatments will provide it to you. So that's a different model again. Uh, you'll hear these sometimes described as quack treatments or fraudulent treatments. Um, I would say it's pretty clear to me, and I hope to you as, as well, that the last is the least desirable, the least desirable route. It involves exposing patients to more chance of work, and there's going to be little scientific gain. There are other negative effects that I'll talk about. 
nevertheless, these, these treatments are out there. So people are using this third model to provide stem cell treatments at the moment. Okay, cutting across all of these, we have also the issues that are raised by the public-private divide and the incorporation of economic considerations into healthcare and medical research. So there are some concerns about the effect of strong intellectual property rights in the commercialization of science. So when we ask how is this research going to be funded, how will the benefits, how will the new therapies be distributed and made available, how much they're going to cost, these are the kinds of concerns that we have. So some people say that strong patent rights can hamper overall scientific pro um, progress and they may restrict access to the end product. I think it's important to stress that by no means all of the effects of privatisation are negative. So private investment can be, um, it's been described as the fastest route to an actual drug. The incentive of profit can spur development and in this sense the goals of patients and industry can align. So you can actually say, well we want this drug quickly, you can make it quickly, let's cooperate and we'll produce it. But nevertheless, what happens at the other end with product availability and access to treatment may be another matter. So we know that there are issues with access to medicines under transnational patient regimes. This has been shown again and again that allowing too strong patient rights to be enforced can create problems with people getting access to treatments. Excuse me, sir. Do you include here the possibility of patenting the mm -hmm. procedure or something like that? Uh, yes, that's, that's essentially what I realize that the area of patenting with respect to step particularly complicated because of the nature of stem cells and so forth. Um, but nevertheless, there are the general principles about the effect of commercialization and the concerns, well, both the fact that commercialization can speed development, but also that it can have an impact at the end stage in terms of access. I think these still apply even though the patent landscape is complex. Does that make sense? Okay. So, some of the factors that differ between clinical trial, experimental treatment, and the unproven treatments. And the first way in which these differ is in terms of safety and efficacy, the standards for safety and the risks that patients are exposed to. So in the clinical trial, defined standards have to be met before you go to each stage of the clinical trial procedure. The trials take place under medical oversight, and there is follow-up care of participants. Experimental treatment in the medical context, a doctor may use an unproven procedure in the hope of achieving some benefit, especially where there's no, option, no other option available, but it has to be deemed to be in the patient's best interest. You've got you think will be of no use at all because why would the patient to that kind of risk? But if you think there's going to be some benefit, if it's in the patient's interest to to give it a try, then there's a justification. And again, patients here are having the treatment under a doctor's supervision, so they're receiving medical care and follow-up. As far as the unproven treatments go, there are no, not necessarily any guarantees as to stand and the treatments don't necessarily take place under medical supervision, so there may not be any follow-up care. What happens when things go wrong? The justification for providing the treatment is also different between these cases. So again, referring to the risks and benefits, a clinical trial requires that the balance of risks and benefits be correct, both in terms of the risks to which participants are exposed, the potential for benefit, and the scientific gain to be made from the trial. And this is going to be based on that safety and efficacy data that's required. With experimental treatment, the possibility of achieving some benefit provides the medical justification for carrying out the treatment. Especially where there is no other hope, where patients have no other option, then the balance of risks and benefits may be in favour of trying the new treatment. I don't have time today to discuss the question of why it should be different standards of justification and risk for experimental treatment of clinical trials. I will point out that it's a similar situation with, with respect to the risk of coercion, um, the risk that it won't be voluntary and so forth, but I don't have time to talk about that today. Um, I have done some other work on this and have a paper on it. Uh, but again, in the case of unproven treatments, the justification pretty much is consumer demand. There may be some medical assessment, there may not. And I think it's important to note that the desperation of patients creates a vulnerable market in this sense. Okay. Another difference.
difference is in how all patients access treatment at the experimental stage. In a clinical trial, participants are recruited on the basis of scientific value first, rather than medical need or desperation. So, notwithstanding the fact that many patients enter a clinical trial through their healthcare provider, but the justification for including them in the trial is that it's going to provide useful scientific information. Um, there's a need for clean data and clinical trials will have exclusion criteria to try and protect that. It's important to note that the exclusion criteria may be influenced not just by purely scientific considerations. So for example, including patients who are more likely to have adverse outcomes can hold you back from getting to the final result of, of the product. Um, and again, this intersects with the issues around privatisation of research and what the goals are. Uh, but patients with respect to clinical trials don't have a right to demand inclusion. So they can say, I'd like to be in the trial, but of right to say, no, you must include me, I have a right to take part in this research. In terms of experimental treatment, access to the treatment is largely a matter between the doctor and the patient. It depends on the doctor's awareness and their willingness to perform the procedure. And it may also have cost implications depending on the healthcare system. In the case of experimental treatment, in fact, the patient may have some legal recourse to demand the treatment to be made available to them. So there have been a number of court cases uh, in the US, uh, in the UK, and in a number of other countries where patients have sought to, to demand that they be given the right to access an experimental treatment on the grounds of medical need. Uh, it's also sometimes described as compassionate use. They don't always succeed in their, in their attempts, but there is space within the law for patients to say, hey, I want to assert a right to have this new treatment. And then finally, in the case of consumer provision, access to treatments is determined case. Access will depend on how affordable the treatments are, and this may also include the costs of health tourism. So can you travel somewhere to have this treatment at the clinic? Mm -hmm. Okay. The three different pathways have different effects in terms of the scientific gain from the pathway. So clinical trials ought to deliver scientific data that contributes to the process of development. Now we know that there are recognised problems of, um, of transparency, completeness of reporting and so forth. Um, so for example, if uh, the incentive, if the aim is to produce a marketable product, there's quite a strong incentive to under-report or suppress negative or adverse results. And we know from experience that this kind of thing has happened within the clinical trial process. So this is another issue related to clinical trials themselves. Uh, but the aim is that they ought to deliver that data and we are looking at ways of, um, ways of making sure that there's more transparency, more complete reporting, more data available. Even without the sort of, some might call it, interference with the integrity of the scientific record um, in the first point, where you might want not to publish your, your results that don't show what you want, um, Commercialisation can also slow down research because of the protection of proprietary information. So companies may not want to publish their data because it has some sort of value to them. And that itself can hamper research even if you're not changing the scientific record as such. So again, strategies to overcome this problem, such as pre-competitive data sharing. Again, as with the role of um, intellectual property and scientific development generally, each of these areas opens up its own issues for, for separate investigation. Okay, experimental treatment is provided as part of a therapeutic activity. So it's not necessarily or primarily in the context of formal research. The regulatory requirements for reporting on clinical trials in jurisdictions where these exist may not apply in the same way. So doctors may be able to provide a treatment to their patient with not necessarily any obligation to report on what the results of that experimental treatment were. I will note that the Declaration of Helsinki talks about unproven treatments and says that if you're going to use an unproven treatment as an experimental procedure, then you ought then to go on and do research into it, to prove safety and efficacy, to record information, to publish it and so forth. That's not binding, of course. It shows the right, the right approach. But the fact is that if doctors are providing experimental treatment, there's currently no requirement that they make the information from that experiment available. And again, as for consumer provision of unproven treatments, there's no requirements for follow-up or reporting. There's pretty much no scientific gain from that kind of thing. Okay. 
There are also differences in terms of what the end product is. So you remember the diagram where I showed you here of the drivers and the development and the result. There's going to be differences in what we get out at the end, depending on whether we go with clinical trials, experimental treatment, or consumer provision. So with a clinical trial, the desired end product is a proven, licensed treatment. Experimental treatments may eventually develop into widespread standardised medical procedure, and this depends very much on how the providers disseminate the information on results. So a lot of clinicians who are trying these experimental therapies in the medical context genuinely want to develop these and to, to bring them online. And so they will publish their results, they will talk about them, they will try and make sure that the field develops. Uh, but that is dependent on the individual researcher and clinician to do. As far as consumer provision and unproven treatments, what is the end product? If they can go on providing whatever they're providing, whether it works or not, then they have the end product they want may not be very much use to anybody else. All of this raises issues in terms of transnational access. So the required standards for proof of safety and efficacy in clinical trials um, and the required standards for consumer safety may vary between countries. This means that a product that has passed certain safety standards may be available in one country, but in another country where the standards are different, it may not be available. Uh, the converse situation, I suppose, is that a product that may be very unsafe and not proven at all can be made available in one place. We might not want it, but it may be made available and people may go and have that treatment. So treatments may be available in one place but not another, or the costs may vary between countries, either due to providers setting different prices in different countries, or there may be different licensing requirements for a treatment to be publicly funded or compensated by insurance. So, for example, in the UK, we have the National Institutes for Health and Clinical Excellence, and they decide which treatments will be provided under the national health system. If they don't meet the standards, they, they won't be available on the public health care system. So this can create issues with what we call health tourism, and I think some of our other presenters are going to talk more about that. But this is not only a problem of safety, that people may go and have treatments that don't work and put them at risk, there are also issues of justice between the population. Is it fair if people in one country can access this and people in another cannot? And there's also a question of justice in terms of inequity of resources, because if some patients can afford to travel, they can access the treatments. Some patients may not be able to afford that and they can't get it, and that's, that may have, a, have implications for justice. Okay, so I've talked about a number of different factors, showing that each of these different pathways has different implications. And the question is, which way should we go? Should we have clinical trials? Should we do experimental treatments? How do we integrate or choose between the various models that are available for the development of therapies? In some cases, there may be conflict between the different pathways. So, for example, if we go very much towards the experimental treatment pathway rather than the clinical trial, then we may reduce the number of participants who can take part in trials and generate trial data and that will undermine the process of clinical trials. Then, of course, quack or fraudulent treatments are not only going to risk harm to their participants, but if we have a lot of treatments that don't work and that have bad side effects, that's going to undermine public faith in science and hold back the development of genuine treatments. Different regulations and procedures can influence the development process. So, for example, in the UK, clinical trials are regulated in one way, experimental treatment is regulated in another. I won't go into the details, but you can see they are differently regulated. And some countries actually explicitly recognise within their regulation different pathways for development. So Japan, for example, has two parallel systems that pretty much mirror clinical trials and experimental treatment, and those are both recognised and legitimate, but the process is differently regulated. So we need to think about what the possible effects are of regulating these pathways in different ways. For example, if the clinical trial process is slower, involves more hurdles and more paperwork, that may push researchers into taking the experimental treatment pathway. Uh, again, from speaking to stem cell researchers in Japan, some of them have expressed this, that it's better for them to provide it as medical treatment rather than do the clinical research to develop the product, because there are so many more hurdles that way. So we need to think about how we're going to shape regulation to optimise the development process. 
In different jurisdictions, there are different levels and forms of regulation. Some jurisdictions have very strict regulation of clinical products and development. Others have not so much. And then, of course, there's the question to what degree the regulations are enforced. And there are various national regulatory agencies that have oversight of the development and provision process for new therapies. So, for example, in the US, the FDA. Uh, in Europe, we have the European Medicines Agency. And within the UK, the Medicine and Healthcare Regulatory Agency. Again, transnational differences in regulation can have effects on the development of new therapies. So what factors should we consider in policy making in relation to the, to the development of new therapies? And this is the point on which I'm about to finish. Um, I remind you of this, this way of thinking about the process. Policy fits in by, by putting regulation in place that helps to shape that process towards the end goal. If our goal is stem cell therapies that are safe, effective, meet patient needs and are available on a fair basis, our question when it comes to regulation and policy needs to be how can policy shape the development process in order to get to the goal we want? And bearing in mind the issues that we've discussed, the ways in which the different pathways differ and the effect that regulation can have on this, I'm going to suggest, and this is my closing argument, that in order to achieve our goals for stem cell therapies, we need three things from our policies. We need policy mechanisms, first of all, that are intended to maximise the scientific gain from the, develop the developmental process. So whether it's a called a clinical trial, whether it's an experimental treatment, we want to make sure that everything that's carried out has as much scientific value as possible. So what we don't want is doctors carrying out treatments that are actually working, but not taking that further to produce a widespread product. So for this, we need increased transparency, and we may also want to think about the reporting requirements for the use of experimental treatments and in clinical trials. But what we need is for that information to be made available and to be made the best use of. The second thing that we need is to reduce barriers and provide incentives towards processes that bring tested and validated treatments towards the clinic. So in terms of that process, what we want to get out at the end is something that has been proven, is safe, it works, it's available. And what we want to do is to discourage or prevent people going off down the other pathways. The third thing, and I think this is quite important and considering as well the theme of our project, is that I think we need to promote transnational standardisation of regulations. So I talked to you about how transnational differences can lead to health tourism, can lead to risk to patients, can lead to problems in justice. I think it's very important that we think not only about the national context when we are making regulation, but what effect is that going to have globally. And this applies both for the process of experimental development, so how do we regulate trials, how do we regulate experimental treatment, um, what are our standards for the provision of stem cell treatments, but we also need to think about transnational standardisation in terms of the production, the licensing, the pricing and the availability of new products. And if we can have attention to all of these three factors, I think we have a chance of making a policy that helps us to meet our goals and fulfil the promise of stem cell Thank you. Tenemos todavía 10 minutos de preguntas y respuestas. ¿Para qué lado? They are going to ask me from the other. Ok. Uh, they can't tell I'm looking at them. Please, yeah, please, please go ahead. No hay preguntas de Irapuato. No hay preguntas. Aquí, Aña y Gustavo. Ella está. Podemos poner la diapositiva. Because I wonder whether you think that there is a role for um, 
having certain standards that are common, but then regulations that also differ to actually encourage medical tourism, but in a way that is not totally unregulated. Um, so, for example, um, a country may have a little bit more relaxed law um, about uh, embryonic stem cell research, and this is where that science will develop. In the same way, um, certain countries may simply encourage uh, certain biomedical industries to sp spring up. Of course, we do not want to have a situation when that industry is completely unregulated. Uh, but isn't there a space of facilitating innovation uh, by providing, um, you know, regulation that is not too stringent? Yes, I agree. So two two points there. First of all, medical tourism is not always a bad thing. If one place has been the centre of development and they're able to provide the best treatments, then maybe it's a good thing that they lead in providing those. But the other is that when I say standardisation of transnational regulations, it doesn't mean everywhere has to have exactly the same. Um, it doesn't mean that they have to have the same regulations. So, for example, yes, we may have a, a case where treatments are regulated more stringently or not available in one country. It doesn't mean that we should say nobody is allowed to travel to have that treatment um, outside of the country. But I think if we're, going, if we're facing that as a situation, we need to think about how both as a country and as a global population we're going to deal with that. What's going to be, for example, the mechanism for supporting patients who come back from, from having the treatment? What are we going to do about people who can't afford to travel to have the treatment? So it doesn't mean that all tourism is bad. We need to keep those sorts of issues about risk and safety and justice between people and between populations in mind when we decide what we're going to do about the situation. Gustavo, y cerramos con Luis Covarrubias. I have a question about about the independence of some of these regulatory agencies, mm -hmm. especially the FDA, yeah. which is the one that, uh -huh. that I know better. Yeah. Uh, many people have concerns about, about their independence in front of, of big corporations, yeah. Yeah. especially in, in some other fields, right? mm -hmm. like agribusiness and all that. But yes. I, I don't know to, to what extent uh, the, the FDA is, <laughs> is independent and is free of mm -hmm. the, the influence of some of these big corporations, yeah. and, and that's also especially important in the case of Mexico because I think we follow closely some of the regulations. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, I don't know if, if, we, if we pay any attention to what's going on in, in, in Europe in, in these terms, mm -hmm. yeah. and if, if, if that also happens in, in Europe. Yeah, the, the independence of, of these agencies. Yeah, so I completely agree with you. I think the influence that, um, for example, biotech companies might have over supposedly independent regulatory agencies can be a, a big problem. I didn't want to harp on it too much because I feel I already talked a little bit about commercialisation and those issues. And I think that the concerns about commercialisation of research um, apply kind of to all of the modes that I talked about. So it's, a, as I said, it's a cross-cutting concern whether you're going the experimental treatment or the clinical trials route. But I think it's, it's very true that they're not always independent. Um, for example, uh, we know in the UK that there have been efforts by, by pharmaceutical companies to try and influence our regulatory body to license their drug for provision with uh, you know, statements that, well, currently our business is located in the UK, um, if you refuse to license it, we might move our premises overseas and then you will lose uh, the economic uh, benefits and so forth. So, yeah, I think it's a real problem um, and it's one of the things we need to think about in terms of the effects of commercialisation on, on science, yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if you can comment on two issues that I think you didn't touch directly. One is the educational level. Uh, I think that it makes a difference if the patient is, or is informed and is capable of receiving the information. And the other is the doctor or medical doctor that wants to go to a procedure and probably naively he wants to try it, mm -hmm. but it may not work because he's not well informed or he doesn't understand completely what is really happening in the field. 
Yeah, I think in, in particular in countries like Mexico, I think this will be a, a very important issue to, 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 to talk about. Yes, so I, I was trying particularly to pick out issues that I felt showed up different, big differences between the different developmental pathways. I think the, the role of the doctor actually does relate to that because a doctor who's providing something as an experimental treatment, you're right, may not have the confidence or may not have the expertise, whereas a clinical trial is usually done on a, you know, it's a team basis uh, and so forth. I think also uh, the, the extent to which patients are informed is very important. Um, I think Anya is going to talk a little bit more about that in her presentation tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I don't see so much that that's different between the three routes that I discussed. Uh, I think patients who want to find out the information, whether they're part of a clinical trial or having experimental treatment, will still ask. Now, of course, the, there is a difference in standards of informed consent that are imposed between a clinical trial and between medical treatment, even experimental medical treatment. So I don't have time now to discuss them in a lot of detail. But I think it's fair to say that when you go to the doctor and you say, doctor, I'm sick, he says, here, have a treatment, you don't sign 10 pages of consent forms. Right? So there is, a, there is a difference there. And of course, that contributes also to the patient experience as well as to being a barrier, potentially. Um, so yeah, th thank you for bringing, bringing the other aspect is uh, the one that you call it the maximum scientific gain. Mm. Because I mean, of course, in, in, in the human, I mean, there are many questions that you cannot answer yeah. only in human. But many other functions you can test it at least have some idea using mm -hmm. animal models. Yes. Then, particularly in the context of stem cells that mm. have a long-term function. If there is a problem, you will not be able to evaluate it within a weeks or even few years. Mm. You have to take in consideration the whole life of the individual. Yeah. Then trying to have an evaluation of a procedure or, or a treatment um, in, in the context of the efficiency or safety, it may not be possible in just a short term. Mm. Yes. You need a long term. Probably animal models needs to be considered. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And the idea of what constitutes scientific gain has to take the long-term view, not just now we have a treatment, it seems to work, it's passed the tests, okay, we're good, we need to keep on, keep on monitoring. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments. Agradecemos a la doctora Sara Chan por su participación.